you are God's dear children, you must try to be like him. Your life must be controlled by love, just as Christ loved us and gave his life for us as a sweet-smelling offering and sacrifice that pleases God. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Which is worse, to not give to the kingdom of God or to give for the wrong reason? Which is worse? We conclude our series of sermons on gifts that you have been given by taking some time to think about the gift of giving. Most of us don't think of the act of giving as a gift. But I'm suggesting today that the ability to give is a gift that everyone has been given. It really is a gift. And I hope you'll understand why before we're finished today. We're going to be thinking about the gift of giving from the perspective of why would anyone give? Why? You've probably heard about this person, though you most likely don't recognize him. He's known today as the father of humanistic psychology. His name is Abraham Maslow. And he developed a theory of human motivation that is based on our needs as human beings. You may recall the pyramid Abraham Maslow called our hierarchy of needs. Some of you may remember this hierarchy from high school or college. According to Maslow, what is the first need that we try to satisfy? Maslow said we first try to satisfy our physiological needs. We must have air and food and water and chocolate, I mean shelter, to survive before we worry about anything else. So first we try to satisfy our physiological needs. Well, after the physiological needs, what comes next in our hierarchy of needs? According to Maslow, the second tier of needs is concerned with environmental stability and security, health, safety, adequate financial resources, and so on. Only when those needs are met can we strive for acceptance and belonging. That's the next level of need that we have. And then we try to achieve confidence and respect. Confidence and respect builds to the highest human need and leads to this question. What need is at the pinnacle of Maslow's pyramid? His answer, self-fulfillment. As you develop in maturity and prosperity, you eventually climb to this level. This is where you actually enjoy your life. You enjoy your abilities and your relationships. You can explore mystery and morality and creativity and so on. I'm explaining this because today we're going to talk about the levels of motivation that we have for giving to the kingdom of God. 
When it comes to our assets and our attitude toward giving something to God's kingdom, we all mature through various stages of development. In a Maslow-like pyramid, we start at the bottom with the most basic of motivation for giving money to the kingdom of God. The first most basic level of motivation for giving to the kingdom of God is self-interest. Raw self-interest. Because you get what you pay for. We learn that in life. You get what you pay for. It's not a spiritual motivation, but it is realistic. Stuff costs money. We enjoy eating, so we pay for it. Some of us join various organizations, and we support them for self-interest purposes. If you're going to join a YMCA or gym or whatever, you support it financially because you know that if you stop paying, then the doors are going to close. So it's really just a self-interest deal. The mentality here is you got to pay to play. We have a great church building which is the result of the generosity and stewardship of many who were here before us. And now we are responsible for maintaining it, cooling and heating it, etc. FYI, the electricity for this building costs over $1,000 every month. We also enjoy Sabbath school materials and many other supplies. Giving because we get something back is one motivation for giving. But it's not the best one. In fact, as far as I can tell, the Bible says nothing at all all about this reason for giving. Nothing. There's no passage that you can point to in the Bible that would give credence to this bottom level motivation for giving. Nevertheless, some people give strictly out of self-interest. Their offerings are simply dues. And some don't even pay their dues. Now the next level of motivation for giving a portion of your earnings to God's work is about simple obedience. At this level, a person gives to the church because God commands us to give. The Bible says, bring your tithes into the storehouse. In fact, the Bible says that those who don't bring both tithe and offerings are robbing God. So people at this level obey. They give out of a sense of duty because they know they're supposed to. It's a very interesting study that was conducted by researchers at Cornell University who looked at the brain science behind giving. They discovered that there are some people who give out of a sense of duty as we just described, because they want to obey God, they give, but grudgingly. What they discovered is that a very different part of the brain is active when the people give with no strings attached. Not out of a sense of duty, but out of a sense of genuine unselfishness. I'd like you to listen as I read. I'm going to quote a portion from that study, a paragraph. 
And I quote, these brain studies show this profound state of joy and delight that comes from giving to others. It doesn't come from any dry action where the act is out of duty in the narrowest sense, like writing a check for a good cause. It comes from working to cultivate a generous quality, from interacting with people. There's the smile, the tone in the voice, the touch on the shoulder. We're talking about altruistic love, end quote. What they found was that people who give altruistically had a 44% reduction in early death. 44% reduction in early death when compared to those who gave out of a sense of duty. So it's good to give at this level, but it's much better to mature in your attitude toward giving and grow to the next level. I'm calling it biblical understanding. Here's where we start to understand principles of stewardship that flow out of Scripture. We follow not just the letter of the law, but we, we grasp the heart and spirit behind the law. For example, consider this basic principle. As we mature in Christ, we come to understand how the Bible teaches that everything we have really belongs to God anyway. We can use our resources for a while when we occupy this earth, but we can't take it with us. Solomon observed in Ecclesiastes 5, everyone came from their mother's womb naked. They will leave as naked as they came. They won't even be able to take a handful of their earnings with them from all their hard work. How did you come into this world? Naked. And you're going to go out the same way. Lisa Rogak has written a fascinating book with the title, Death Warmed Over. And it's a combination cookbook and sociological study of funeral meals and rituals. She starts it with the story of a man dying at home in his bed. I love this story. He could smell the aroma of chocolate chip cookies, his favorite kind, baking downstairs. And oh, he wanted one more cookie before he died. So he dragged his, bed, his body out of bed, rolled down the stairs, crawled into the kitchen, reached out a trembling hand to grasp one final cookie. When he felt the sting of a spatula smack his hand. Put that back, his wife said. There for the funeral. That's the human condition right there. I'm telling you. Solomon had many, many cookies. And he kept thinking, I want one more cookie. Just one more cookie before I die. Then I'll be happy. And then one night out comes the spatula. Whack. They don't belong to you. They're for the funeral. Ask not for whom the spatula whacks, it whacks for thee. It's God's stuff, and you cannot keep it. So at this level, at this level, we begin to understand and follow what the Bible teaches on the topic of giving. 
we take seriously the teaching of Jesus who said things like this in Luke chapter 6, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will be determined the amount you get back. So those of you who are giving it out in teaspoons are getting it back in teaspoons. You who give it with a shovel are getting it back with a shovel. And if you give it out with a front end loader, you'll get back just as much or more. You've probably never heard of Robert... Letourneau. But Mr. Letourneau was one of the most inspiring Christian businessmen and entrepreneurs the world has ever seen. A sixth grade dropout. Robert went on to become the leading manufacturer of earth moving machinery in his day with manufacturing of earth-moving machinery plants on four continents, more than 300 patents to his name, major contributions to highway construction, mining, and heavy equipment that forever changed the world. Back in the 40s and 50s, he designed and invented a lot of heavy-duty, earth-moving equipment. He was very sharp and innovative. When he started his business, he made a covenant to give God 10% of his profits. As time went on and he was blessed more and more, He made a new covenant with God to give God 20%. You know, sometimes when a person starts getting more money, they decrease the percentage of giving. Giving a dime out of a dollar is not very much. After all, it's only a dime. But if you've made a million dollars, then 10% is $100,000. And the more you make, the more you're likely to say, well, maybe 5%, because after all, that's a lot of money. Isn't that interesting? Hardly anybody has a problem giving a dime out of a dollar. It's only when that dollar grows that it becomes difficult. But Robert Letourneau did it the other way. As the business increased, he gave 20%. And as the business continued to increase, he raised it to 30, then 40, then 50, then 60%. And when he died, He was giving 90% to the Lord. 90%. Of course, God had so blessed him that the 10% which he kept was a lot more than you will ever make anyway. But God just will not be outgiven. You can't do it. And when you begin to understand the Bible principles of giving and give accordingly, God will bless accordingly. This brings us to the next level of motivation, which is gratitude. This is where you've been ambushed by the reality of God's grace and give in response to that. 
The psalmist says in Psalm 116, verse 12, What can I give back to God for all that he has given to me? What has God given to you? You've been saved from eternal death by Jesus. And when this reality takes hold of our hearts, the most natural response is one of giving back out of gratitude. God wants to bring us to this point where we give willingly. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, you should each give then as you have decided, not with regret or out of a sense of duty. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. See, it's the most natural reaction in the world. When we are saved, we want to give something back in response to the gift we received. When our hearts are seized by the gospel and we understand our condition before a holy God who bridged the separation between God and man by dying on a cross, we naturally want to respond in a tangible way. When we really get it, and that's important to this, when we really get it, and we start to wrap our hearts around the greatest expression of love ever offered, we won't need to coerce or manipulate people to give. Offerings will flow to God's work out of converted hearts and pure motives. Ellen White writes, When the light and love of Jesus illuminates the hearts of his followers, there will be no occasion for urging or begging their money or their service. I have never been one to promote any kind of giving that smells like a gimmick. I don't want people to give to the work of the church because they want a plaque in their honor or because they feel coerced or tricked. No, I want to be part of a community of faith where everyone gives generously and selflessly out of gratitude for what Christ has done for us. And this brings us to the final level that we reach as we mature in our giving patterns. Gratitude for the grace of God naturally leads to the highest level, the level of love. Sacrificial love. See, God wants us to give cheerfully, motivated by a spirit of sacrificial love. The Apostle Paul made it very clear in his letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13. He said, even if I give away everything that I have and sacrifice myself, but have no love, I gain nothing. That's because the reason for the gift of giving, the reason for the gift of giving is to become more like God. After all, God so loved that he gave. Love is what motivates God to give. And that's what the gift of giving 
is all about. Becoming more like God. That's what the Bible verse that we read for our scripture lesson today is all about in Ephesians chapter 5. Since you are God's dear children, you must try to be like him. Your life must be controlled by love, just as Christ loved us and gave his life for us as a sweet-smelling offering and sacrifice that pleases God. Jesus was at a dinner party with some religious leaders. And while he was having dinner, a woman who was a former prostitute whose life had been changed by Jesus came to him, walking into the room unannounced, she took a bottle of extraordinarily expensive perfume and without saying anything to anybody she went to Jesus' feet and started pouring it out and massaging it into his feet with her hair. I can just imagine somebody stopping her a day later after hearing that story and saying to this woman, what were you thinking? You don't have any money. Why'd you go out and buy such an expensive bottle of perfume? And why did you do such a foolish thing with it? And I can hear her say, well, I wouldn't expect you to understand. But love made me do it. Because of Jesus, my past is forgiven. Today is a blessing, and my future is secure. So you call it foolish, and maybe it was, but love made me do it. My dear church family, it's my dream that all of us would have a longer and better look at the blood-stained cross. that we would have a better understanding of what Jesus did to take the consequences of our sin, your sin and mine, upon himself. He paid the price for our redemption. Oh, that we would see it clearly and at that moment in time be overwhelmed by the gift that's been given to us. And at some point when we just scratch our heads and say, why? Why is a gift that wonderful offered to me absolutely free? Why would he do such a thing? I hope you can hear the voice of Christ saying, love made me do it. Love for you and you and you and you. Call it crazy if you want to, but love made me do it. And then I hope that as a result of that encounter with the love of Christ, as a church, we will grow from self-interest to obedience to biblical understanding to gratitude and love that we will mature to the place where we are known as a church that pours outrageous amounts of resources into the work of God, into the needs of the poor, to those who are forgotten and left alone. And when people say, how can one church give so extravagantly I hope we'll just say with humility because love makes us do it. Father in heaven, 
Thank you so very much for your love. A love that can never be measured. A love that motivated you to give the immeasurable gift of your son Jesus to redeem us from the consequences of our sin. Please help each one of us to have a better understanding of your love and become more like you, willing to give because of love. Thank you, Father, for hearing my prayer. I pray in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus. Amen. Please join in our hymn of consecration, hymn number 634, Come, All Christians, Be Committed. Love, come again to. Me.
Thank you, Father, for being with us. Please continue to go with each one of us in a special way the remaining hours of this, your holy Sabbath that as we begin another week, those around us cannot help but see and know that we have been touched, embraced by the love of God. And that motivates us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.